Good afternoon from Miami Beach. This is Dr. John Bennett for Neurosurgical TV, the headquarters here. Um, we have the pleasure today of having uh, Dylan Digiovac, Digiovac, a medical student from Cameroon. Uh, and we have a guest panelist. Let's introduce Nathalie first. Hello, Nathalie. So Hello, John. Hello, everyone. I am Natalie Crystal Gomsi. I'm a medical doctor in Cameroon, and I'm also a member of the African uh, uh, Future Neurosurgeons. Very good. The AFAN, Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. And, and welcome. And, and welcome, Dylan. Uh, thank you for presenting, and it's all yours. Thank you, John. Um, I'm Dylan from Cameroon and final year medical student and member of the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. So today, as part of our series on the neuroanatomy lectures, we're going to be talking about the surgical anatomy of the, the midbrain. So let me just get this right here going to be talking about the surgical. Okay. You got a large screen, right? Let me get ready. Okay. okay. Is it okay? Uh, it's still not big, like it should, like you usually get it. Okay, let me get. Yeah, I think at the bottom there, okay. one of those. There you go, there you go, perfect. Okay. So, talking of, well, in order to, to reach our objectives concerning the surgical anatomy of the, the midbrain, we're going to go through a plan in, uh, <clears throat> in which we have an introduction. We have a, a, a little talk about the embryology. We have uh, uh, the description of the surgical anatomy, and we are going to go through a few surgical approaches concerning the, the, the midbrain. So as we can say, the midbrain is that most rostral, almost cranial part of the brain stem since the brain stem is made up of three parts, so it is that most cranial or most rostral part of the brain stem that originates from the primary brain vesicles. So initially, at about three to four weeks gestational age, we have three primary brain vesicles, amongst which we have the prosencephalon, the mesencephalon, and the rhomb encephalon. So as you can see here, all through the development, the mesencephalon stays the mesencephalon and will give rise to the midbrain. So in this midbrain, we have posterior and anterior part from which the neural cells from the ventricular zone forming an intermediate zone will be responsible of the formation of the allop plates posteriorly and the basal plates anteriorly. So these plates are the main structures that are going to pursue the development of the different intra mesencephalic structures till the formation of an adult midbrain. So besides the development of this intermediate zone into the ella and the basal plates, we have the marginal region, the marginal layer, which is invaded by fibers originating from different layers of the central nervous system, amongst which you can talk about the, 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 the cerebral cortex. So these layers, these fibers, these neural fibers later on are going to be diverted laterally to form the cruz cerebri. So the alloy plates and the basal plates are going to be those structures that will be responsible for the formation of the different nuclei and the, the, the white matter fibers present inside the adult midbrain. So the allop plates are going to be responsible for the formation of the posteriorly, the superior and inferior colliculi, which are part of what is known as the quadrigeminal plate. And anteriorly, they will be responsible for the formation of the red nuclei on both sides and the substantia nigra on both sides. Meanwhile, the basal plates are responsible for the formation of the somatic efferences of the uh, oculomotor and trochlear nerves and the visceromotor efferences for the, the, the third cranial nerve, precisely the edingal westphal nucleus, we originating from the, the, the basal plate. 
So this, those are uh, uh, practically or, or mainly the, the essential structures present in the midbrain, and that will be originating respectively from the alar plates and the basal plates till the formation of an adult midbrain. So talking about the external morphology of the midbrain, we can say that the midbrain is that structure that extends superiorly from the diencephalon above and is limited inferiorly by the pons, anteriorly limited by the exit of the crura cerebri from the cerebral hemispheres, sorry, from the cerebral hemispheres just above, and the caudal edge of the mammillary bodies. And caudally, it is limited by the entry of each crust at the level of the basal pons. So one of the most uh, 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 recognizable or most essential structures present anterior, at the anterior surface of the midbrain is the crus cerebri. So there are two of them, they are the crura cerebri. So there are these structures that emerge from, from the cerebral hemispheres above, just below the optic tracts, you can see here, converge medially as they go through the mesencephalon and enter or terminate at the level of the basal pons. So, surgically relevant is to note that medially to each of these cruise cerebri, we have the third nerve, the third cranial nerve, which is the oculomotor nerve, and it is present here on both sides inside what is known as the interpeduncular fossa. And so, this inter interpeduncular fossa is in very close rapport with the interpeduncular cistern, which contains cranial nerve number three, as we said, it exits medially at the level of each cross cerebri medially, and it goes through this interpeduncular fossa and the interpeduncular cistern. And also, apart from this cranial nerve number three, it contains the upper branch of the basilar artery. So this basilar artery resulting from the union, from the union of, the two, of the two vertebral arteries. So here we have a better image that depicts the pathway of this cross cerebri. So as they originate from the cerebral hemispheres just below the optic tracts, the optic, uh, yeah, the optic tracts, they go medially at level of the of the the the, mes, the, the midbrain and go through the bone. So the area that is is of interest to us is mainly this region from the basal bones till the inferior part of the optic tract, which is going to be part of this midbrain. So here we see it better. It is done anteriorly at the level of, uh, of our midbrain. So going further at the level of the posterior aspect of the midbrain, we have very uh, uh, prominent structures. First, we have four elevations, which constitute what is known as the corpora quadrigemina. So in these four elevations, we have two rostral elevations, which are called the superior colliculi, and two caudal or inferior elevations known as the inferior colliculi. So these four elevations constitute what's known as the quadrigeminal, uh, uh, the quadrigeminal plate, the corpora quadrigemina, which originates posteriorly from the alar plate. So Marking the junction between the midbrain and the diencephalon is the posterior commissure here. And marking the junction between the midbrain and the pons below is the exit of the trochial nerve, generally inferiorly here. So one other important structure that we can visualize at the level of the posterior surface of the, the midbrain is the pineal gland. That gland that's responsible for the production of melanocortin, essential hormone for sleep, and that's usually the site of certain endocrine tumors, be it at the level of the child or even at the level of the adult. So this pineal gland extends posteriorly between the superior, between the, 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 the two elevations, be it between the, superior, the, the elevation of the superior colliculi. So be, on the left and the right side between the two elevations of the superior colliculi. 
So here we see it better. We see our superior colliculus on one side, both of them superior colliculi, inferior colliculi on both sides, and between the two elevations of the superior colliculi, we have the pineal gland, the endocrine gland. And then one important structure that we have to note here, or two important structures, are the superior brachium and the inferior brachium, which are those structures located laterally, superior laterally to the superior and the inferior colliculi, respectively, and that permit connection between the superior colliculus and lateral geniculate body and the inferior colliculus and the medial geniculate body. So here again, we can visualize the cerebral, the cerebral peduncle, which is generally a name uh, uh, used to replace the cruz pedunculi, but it's not really uh, that appropriate because the cruz cerebral, uh, uh, the cruz, uh, uh, the cruz cerebra is mainly made up of those fibers, mostly made up of those fibers originating from the, the cortex, those descending fibers mostly. So here we have a view of the posterior part of the, the, our midbrain. Here again, we see the superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi. And here we have our intercollicular region, which is a very relevant region in surgical approaches. Here again, we have the intercollicular region, the superior and the inferior colliculi. And here we have our inferior brachium and the superior brachium a little bit removed uh, surgically. So talking about the internal morphology of uh, our midbrain, we have to note that in our midbrain, we have white matter fibers, we have a, a, a nuclei, we have, um, we have a, a, a gray matter, <clears throat> we have gray matter neurons. So these different structures can be organized into three main regions, which are the tectum, which is the roof of the midbrain, more mainly represented by our quadrigeminal plate made up of our two superior colliculi and our two inferior colliculi. Next, we have second region, the periaqueductal gray matter, which is, as the name implies, that gray matter, assembly of, of, of gray matter neurons present just around the, the, the cerebral aqueduct, just surrounding the cerebral aqueduct. And then the third region, we have the tegmentum, which is that part, that anterior part of the, the, the midbrain that extends from the inferior part of the, te, of the, the, the tectum till the region behind the substantia nigra. And we better see it in a transverse skirt of the, the midbrain. So this posterior part, this, uh, uh, this, the, uh, it is to be noted that the posterior part of the midbrain is also in close rapport with the quadrigeminal system posterior superiorly. So here we have a transverse skirt, as we are saying, you can see the three regions. We have the tectum with the quadrigeminal plate here. It is to be noted that we are looking at the, the, the inferior, inferior colliculus on both sides, inferior uh, uh, colliculi. We have the periaqueductal gray matter, which is part of our reticular uh, uh, ascending activating system, that, that one of those main structures that controls conscience. And then we have the tegmentum, that extends from the inferior part of the tectum till that portion behind the substantia nigra. So generally it documents, say it extends till the substantia nigra, but doesn't include the substantia nigra. So the substantia nigra is not part of this segment. Here, going a little bit into details, into the tectum, as we said, it is also called the quadrigeminal plate. Uh, uh, located mainly by this superior and inferior colliculi. And so it should be noted that the superior colliculi is part of the visual system. So it is a main relay structure for the fibers originating from the optic, from the optic tract as they go through the lateral geniculate body and terminate at the level of, this, uh, the, of the superior colliculus, then leave from the superior colliculus till the Edinger-Westphal nucleus for 
the, 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 the photomotor reflex, so the, the, the light reflex during uh, clinical evaluations. And then we have the inferior colliculi, which are, on the other hand, part of the auditory system. So they receive fibers from the contralateral cochlear nucleus, from the dorsal and ventral nuclei of the lateral lemniscus, from the contralateral and ipsilateral superior olive, that part of the, uh, the medulla of Longata, from the ipsilateral medulla, from the ipsilateral, sorry, medial superior olive, and the descending projections from the, from, the, from, the, from the cortex. And so they are connected as part of this auditory system. They are connected to the medial, sorry, the medial geniculate body by the inferior brachium, while the superior colliculus is connected to the lateral geniculate body as part of our, our visual system through the, 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 the superior brachium. So here we have an image that depicts the connections, as we, as we were saying, of the superior colliculus. So we have our superior brachium, or brachium of the superior colliculus. We have the lateral gen geniculate body. And we have the fibers originating from the optic tract. And part of those fibers will go through the lateral geniculate body and terminate at level of the superior uh, colliculus through the superior superior brachium, a level of the superior colliculus, and then exit from the superior colliculus to the edinger westphal nucleus for the, the, the photomotor reflex or the light reflex. Here on the other hand, we have an image that depicts the connections of the inferior colliculi on both sides as they receive uh, fibers from the cochlea, be the lateral or the, or the contralateral cochlea, and then as we'll see later from the, from the lateral lemniscus. Talking about the periaqueductal gray matter, as we said, it is that gray matter, that assembly of gray matter neurons that surrounds the aqueductal, the, the, the cerebral aqueduct. And then the tegmentum, as it extends from the inferior part of the tectum till the substantia nigra, but without including the substantia nigra. So in this tectum, we can find, depending on the level at which we are in the midbrain, we can find. Uh, uh, our red nuclei, we can find uh, uh, different fibers, be they ascending or descending fibers from the cerebral cortex or to the cerebral cortex or the thalamus. And we can find uh, uh, various nuclei along with this tegmentum. So a transverse cut to the caudal portion of the midbrain depicts the inferior colliculus. Here we have our inferior colliculus, which is actually made up of a pericentral nucleus, an external nucleus, and a central nucleus, which constitute this inferior colliculus. We have the trochlear nucleus here, and we have the decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncles. So apart from those structures, we have other uh, uh, parts of uh, our descending and ascending uh, uh, white matter uh, systems. We have the medial lemniscus, the anterolateral system, is part of those uh, uh, fibers which we're going to see later, later on. We have the ant anterior trigeminal fibers, which cause here, we have the decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncles, still inside our tectum. So talking about those pathways that go through the midbrain, actually they are uh, ascending and descending pathways. So the medial lemniscus, which is part of those ascending pathways, as we can see here, we go through the midbrain, originating from the, 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 the sensory receptors at the level of the superior and the inferior part of the body. We have the anterolateral system, which uh, carries the nerve impulses for the pain and temperature sensation, which is going to, to go through our midbrain here. Here we have the fibers right from the spinal cord through the, 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 the medulla oblongata and the pons, and then goes through the midbrain just beside the, the medial lemniscus. We have the posterior and anterior trigeminal thalamic tracts, those tracts that receive the, 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 the sensory uh, uh, innervation from the face mainly. So here we see in blue, see in blue here, 
and then we have the medial longitudinal fasciculus as part of those pathways. So here in detail, we see the corticospinal tract, which is part of the rather descending pathways, should we didn't mention it, but it's part of the descending pathways from the cortex, internal capsule, right through the brainstem. And as we are concerned by the midbrain, it goes through the anterolateral part, yes, yeah, we're talking about the cruse cerebri. So the medial and lateral lemnisci, here again, we have our midbrain, they cause side to side with the medial lemnisci and the actual lateral system with the, the, the innervations from the, the pain and temperature sensations that go to the thalamus and then to the parietal cortex mainly. And then here we have the trigeminal thalamic tract receiving nerve uh, sensation from the, the face going through trigeminal nerve and then later on ascending to the thalamus and then to the, the, the parietal cortex. So our midbrain has rapports or relationships with various structures. So it has neurovascular relationships. It has cisternal relationships, which are very relevant structures during the surgical approaches to the midbrain. So talking about the neurovascular relationships, we have here we can identify our cerebral peduncles, through cerebri anteriorly, and then we realize that they are in close relationship with one of those three neurovascular complexes of the midbrain of the, the brain stem. We are talking about the upper complex, which is made up of the superior cerebral, superior cerebellar artery, sorry the midbrain itself, and then the cranial nerve number three, four, and five, respectively the oculomotor, the trochlea, and the trigeminal nerve. We have posteriorly the cerebellum mesencephalic fissure, that fissure that exists between the midbrain and cerebellum, above which you can see the quadrigeminal cistern. We have the superior cerebellar peduncle, and then the tentorial surface of the cerebellum. Talking about the cisternal relationships, just about uh, on every, every surface of the midbrain, we have these cisternal relationships, which means all of these structures are relevant because in access, be it to the tectum posteriorly, tegmentum anteriorly, or other portions of the midbrain, we have the substantial nigra here, Knowing these cisternal anatomies will be important as most often they will be uh, crossed by the surgeon in order to access the midbrain. So amongst these cisterns, we have the quadrigeminal cistern. As the name implies, it's just around our quadrigeminal plate. We have the ambient cistern. We have the crural cistern just anterior to the cross cerebri. We have the interpeduncular cistern between the, cere the cerebral peduncles. Here we have an image that depicts our interpeduncular system here mainly. And then uh, this reposterior superiorly will have the, the quadrigeminal system, which are those which are mainly the two main cisterns, anteriorly and posteriorly. Here again we have an image that depicts our interpeduncular cistern our ambient cistern and laterally, quadrigeminal cistern posteriorly, and then ambient crural cistern and laterally again at the level of the core of the cruse cerebri. So what about the surgical approaches? Actually, during surgical approaches to the midbrain, what is essential or what's important to, to consider is that, first of all, this is one of the, 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 the main structures of our brain stem, which we know the brain stem is that structure of the central nervous system in which we have many centers for control of uh, the vital organs and the, the normal functioning of our, our, our nervous or neuroendocrine system. So access to this region, actually uh, is related to, to a lot of blood vessels, is related to a lot of, of, of cranial nerves, and most often the, the 
tumors, or I, I, I'll talk directly about the tumors. Most of the tumors in this region will be associated to either compression of the, the cerebral aqueduct that goes in the midbrain, which will be associated to a hydrocephalus, which are associated lesion, lesions that can make the surgical approaches to this midbrain a little bit uh, 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 risky. And the prognosis in tumoral uh, uh, lesions of this region are, is really not that uh, good. So during surgical approaches, we have to consider the safe entry zones. So in this midbrain, what are the safe entry zones to which we can go? And the surgical approaches that expose best this safe entry zone. So among the safe entry zones, we have three main safe entry zones. They're actually the, the essential safe entry, entry zones. We have the anterior mesencephalic zone, anterior mesencephalic zone that extends between the optic tract and the opt and the yeah the optic tract and the cortico spinal tract it would be better seen in a transverse skirt we have the lateral mesencephalic sulcus posteriorly extending between the medial geniculate body and extending from the medial geniculate body to the the, the ponto mesencephalic sulcus behind and the intercollicular region, which, as the name implies, is between the two, between the, the, the between each colliculus. So at the level of the superior colliculus, it is between the left and the right superior colliculi, and the, and inferiorly the left and the right inferior colliculi. Talking about the surgical approaches, we have the orbitozygomatic approach, the subtemporal approach, the median supracerebellar infratentorial approach and the extreme lateral supracerebellar infratentorial approach. So going a little bit into detail with this, first of all, the safe entry zones. And we said there are mainly three. We have the intercollicular region, the lateral mesencephalic sulcus, and the anterior mesencephalic zone. Anterior mesencephalic zone naturally cortical spinal tract and the optic tract medially and then the, the tracts of the oculomotor nerve and the lateral mesencephalic sulcus and here the, 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 the intercollicular region here we see anterior mesencephalic zone lateral mesencephalic sulcus between the medial geniculate body extending downwards to the ponto the the, the Pontal mesencephalic sulcus, yes, the pontal mesencephalic sulcus. And here we have the intercollicular region between the, the colliculi on each side. So the anterior mesencephalic zone is mostly preferred for those anterior midbrain lesions. So lesions at the level of the anterior part of the midbrain here. And it's bounded medially by the oculomotor tract motor tract, tractus of, the, of the, the, the third cranial nerve, the motor tract, and laterally by the corticospinal tract. So this uh, 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 anterior mesencephalic zone takes advantage of the fact that between this corticospinal tract and the, 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 the oculomotor tract, mostly the substantia nigra and the, the, the red nucleus are behind, giving a few centimeters of access to the surgeon for the anterior lesions of the midbrain. The lateral mesencephalic sulcus, on the other hand, runs downward from the medial geniculate body, as we said, the medial geniculate body, to the pontal mesencephalic sulcus posteriorly. Sorry. It is crossed by the posterior B2 segment, the medial posterior choroidal artery, the cerebellar mesencephalic segments of the superior cerebellar artery, the trochial nerve, the trochial nerve in itself, cranial nerve number four, which you can visualize here, trochial nerve, and the tentorial edge, a uh, level of the tentorium cerebri. So, all of these structures, be it the vascular structures or the nervous structures, have to be taken into consideration and protected during approaches to this lateral mesencephalic uh, uh, sulcus, which gives mostly, act, as you can see here, access to lateral regions at the level of the tegmentum of the midbrain. 
And then lastly, we have the intercollicular region between the, the collicular on each the, the colliculi on each side, superior colliculi and inferior colliculi, and it is the most cherished area for small neurotomies as between these two colliculi, between these two colliculi, there are very few fibers. So there's really little, little uh, nervous damage during the surgical procedure, and the access is relatively easier for small neurotomies. So talking about the surgical approaches, we have the orbital zygomatic approach, which best exposes the anterior portion of the, the anterior portion of the midbrain, including the, the interpeduncular fossa, the interpeduncular fossa, and the, 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 the cruciate cerebri with the oculomotor nerve itself, and part of the, 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 the inferior lateral part of the, of the lateral midbrain side. So this approach can be best used to, ex, to, to, to expose the anterior mesencephalic zone for surgical approaches to the anterior part of the midbrain. On the other hand, we have the subtemporal approach, as the name implies, below the temporal loop, which gives exposure to the lateral part of the midbrain, mainly the lateral part of the midbrain. So, yeah, mainly the lateral part of the midbrain, and it can be one of those procedures used to expose the lateral part of the midbrain for access to the lateral mesencephalic zone. And then we have the median supracerebellar infratentorial approach. As the name implied, it is medially, medial curved above the cerebellum and below the, the, the tentum cerebri. So it gives access to this posterior part of the, the, the midbrain through which we can have our safe entry zone, the intercollicular region, or access to posterior region lesions of the of the midbrain. Thank you for your kind attention. Okay, I'm I'm sorry there. I'll we'll sleep at the wheel. Don't, uh, once again, excellent. Technically, uh, the the photos are awesome. Uh, I couldn't imagine Thank doing you. this kind of presentation when I was a student. Uh, and I'm interested to hear from uh, two neurosurgeons that came, Dr. Kabulo and Dr. Marco, sure, and Nathalie too, but let's hear from the neurosurgeons on, on uh, how they use anatomy of the midbrain. I'm sure they, there are certain pathologies that affects the midbrain. I'm kind of interested to hear. And then, they, uh, and then comes Nauru, another neurosurgeon. Can you comment, uh, Marco or Dr. Kubulo, on uh, the importance of... I, I, greetings, Marco. How you doing? I get on. Okay, Marco. Hi, guys. Hello. Sorry. Hello, everybody. Oh. The delay, Hello, Dr. Dr. Marco. Uh, well, I just seen the, the presentation and I congratulate uh, with, with colleagues for the, the beautiful panel and the beautiful anatomy uh, you showed of the midbrain. Uh, um, uh, usually an important uh, uh, aspect of the uh, uh, posterior fossa surgery uh, and also uh, an important aspect uh, during the middle uh, fossa surgery. Uh, so I just uh, want to say that's an excellent presentation. Uh, and obviously, is, um, uh, as, as I just, just uh, highlighted, uh, surgery that needs uh, uh, met meticulous uh, um, analysis of the best approach, uh, depending by the pathology, obviously. Uh, just that. Thanks, Dr. Cabulo. Thank, thank you. That's Marco. Uh, we'll hear from Dr. Cabulo now. Hello, Dr. Cabulo. That, that's Dr. Marco. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful, this great presentation. Uh, I enjoyed uh, this uh, anatomy is like, 
the basis of neurosurgery or any surgery. When you want to practice surgery, you, you have to know the anatomy, you have to know where you are going, where you are not going. So thank you so much for the presentation. I want to just add one thing, like um, <clears throat> you were talking about those uh, relation, the relationship with the systems. Uh, the systems around the midbrain, especially the ambient and quadrigeminal systems, they help us too much uh, in case of a traumatic brain injury when you want to decide either you want to do a decompressive craniectomy or not. Uh, usually we check uh, on those systems if they are effaced or they are compressed and how many are they compressed and uh, how many are patent. So they help too much for you to, to do um, a decompressive craniectomy. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Kabulo. Thank you, Dr. Kabulo. And uh, Nauru, how are you doing today? Welcome from, I guess you're in, in Morocco, I'm not sure. But uh, Nauru, could you comment? I don't know hi, um, you saw. Go ahead, go ahead, Nauru, go ahead. Uh, hi, hello, everybody, and uh, thank you, Dylan, for your great, uh, brilliant uh, presentation. I'm sorry I come, I come late. <laughs> So uh, thank you. Uh, it is uh, it is nice to to, saw, to 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 see you to done this great job because like you know you are aspire to done neurosurgery and it is very good to know anatomy and uh, I think uh, it is good things what you do and Vendula uh, on Blogata it is uh, uh, I see your presentation but I come so late so uh, it is good but like uh, Dr. Cabolo said. Uh, it is very important to know uh, this sit on uh, what she, uh, she said. Because I, 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 I performed this craniectomy the a lot of time, and I know that it is uh, very important to know that. So it is very nice uh, to know your anatomy because it is your way. So thank you for your presentation. Well, you, and you know, you know, you know, uh, you know Nuru, I know uh, you're busy. You came late. That's okay. We're well, just glad you came. Uh, yeah, can, can, you, can you tell us um, uh, why it's important to know the anatomy of the midbrain and, and where have you been in the midbrain yourself uh, doing op what type of operations have you done in the midbrain? Have you done any operations in the midbrain, Nuru, in that area? Uh, yes, of course, yes. Oh, okay. I, I don't know. I'm not a neurosurgeon, but what kind of pathology have you seen in the midbrain? Um, but like uh, um, I, can, I guess, well, for the first time, uh, sometimes we follow uh, this uh, uh, area to know if that is uh, if uh, you have compression of uh, midbrain, uh, um, and you can perform cardiac decompressive. Sometimes you can have uh, like so just like a tumor. Uh, and uh, we have to, to perform uh, excision of the somatoid. We can perform, uh, um, like, uh, we can say, a, a pterinal approach. And uh, uh, sometimes we can perform um, uh, a bot tumor. Uh, we don't have more, uh, more uh, experience. I, I, don't have, I don't have more experience about uh, tumor in. But I know that it is a landmark to me about my uh, cisterns to do my uh, my scar my uh, sit and scar to, to know if I will go to to, to perform a craniectomy decompressive or not. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, have, I, have a, I have a question, John. Go ahead. Go ahead. For the neurosurgeons on the on panel, I'd like to know uh, uh, when you have a case of uh, a midbrain tumor. Actually, do you perform the surgery? And if yes, what's the, the prognosis of the patients after the surgery? Which approaches do you use in case you operate? And what's the prognosis in, uh, over there in your countries? OK, thank you. Maybe Dr. Marco want to answer, then I'll also give a comment. Dr. Marco, uh, get on. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, well, uh, about the, the question, uh, it does depend obviously by the tumor. We cannot forget that there exists some uh, uh, low grade, grade glioma uh, of, the, uh, um, uh, of the tectum that uh, don't have any uh, surgical uh, indication, but just need 
a follow up and if there is a concomitant hydrocephalus need a, uh, um, a ventricular peritoneal shunting uh, or a, a third ventricular cisternotomy uh, and other pathology like uh, some uh, cases I uh, I saw during my experience uh, like cavernoma that's a need on the contrary a surgical approach when they bleed uh, yeah. So in this case, uh, uh, the safety zone uh, are obviously the the first choice uh, in this case. Uh, and um, uh, other pathology I I saw when uh, meson uh, middle brain is involved uh, is uh, a case I remember of uh, um, uh, uh, a guy uh, twenty five years old uh, who implanted uh, when he was newborn. Uh, a ventricular peritoneal shunt. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, shunt uh, uh, infected. Uh, he, he has an infection because he was a, a vet and uh, he had a, a stranger infection caused by uh, by dog. Uh, I actually don't remember what's the, the pathogen exactly. So we need to remove this uh, ventricular shunt. A problem, this ventricular shunt going deeper until the sylvium aqueductum so it was a, a, a problem to remove because uh, there was the risk to uh, to uh, put, uh, get traction the midbrain and so cause a disaster so in this case uh, we perform endoscopically guided removal we go in deeper until the uh, sylvium aqueductum and we perform a sort of, uh, of lys lysis uh, around the, uh, the ventricle, the, the uh, aqueductum catheter, in this, obviously, in this case, we can say that, and we are able to remove. Obviously, all the procedure was done uh, performing uh, evocate potential, and it was uh, uh, actually a great success. And at the same time, we perform a ventricular sternotomy, and now this guy is, is uh, well being. Is uh, also married and has some uh, child children. Wow! wow. Congratulations! Good to hear that story. Great. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Doctor Marco, for that uh, wonderful operation. Yeah. <laughs> they are like uh, the land your question, like Doctor Marco was saying. They are patient with the lesions in the midbrain, and you operate on them, they do well. But there are also other lesions where you can just watch and see. You follow up your patient, uh, like uh, last time when they were presenting about anatomy, variant anatomy, I showed a case of uh, midbrain cavernoma. Uh, usually a case like that, uh, you only go, let me try if I can share the image, Dr. John. Yes, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, uh, can you see that? Yes. Yeah, you can see. Like that, that that's a, Cavernoma of the midbrain. Um, can you see it? Yes, you can see. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. yes, so that, like that one, you can do your uh, supracerebellar infratentorial approach, uh, which is going to allow you to see the posterior uh, and posterior lateral surface of the midbrain. Me, Dr. Like, Kumar, could, uh, you use your, could you use your pointer? You can use your pointer, you know. There, there you go. Okay. Can you see it left yes, right now? Yeah, you right? yeah, yeah. can see it. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is um, a, a cavernoma of the midbrain extending in the lateral aspect of the pons, like you can see here. This is T1 weighted image on uh, MRI. There is also uh, another picture uh, on um, the T2 weighted image. You see that here it's a it, it looks like a bleed. Um, it's a bleed, it's white, it's hyper intense on T1. It was also hyper intense on T2, which is like a subacute bleed. Uh, usually it's a cavernoma. At the first bleed, you see it like, like this. But if it starts to bleed uh, several times, then you will see a rim of uh, hemosiderin around there. So a hypodense uh, rim around that lesion. So this one with the supracerebellar infratentorial approach, you can now see, you can go through it and visualize the posterior aspect of the midbrain and also the posterior lateral. Like you were talking about uh, self-entry zones, uh, you mentioned about them, the, the anterior ones. They are also anterior, uh, the posterior um, 
safe entry zones where you can go and access this lesion. But now for this patient, the patient presented with um, one day issue of vomiting, uh, and uh, the patient collapsed. He's a barber. He was shaving his client and uh, started to vomit, and uh, he lost consciousness. Was taken at the local uh, hospital where he got a bit of injections, some injections, and he regained consciousness. But he became hemiplegic. Taken to our hospital after resuscitation, the patient was doing well. Uh, no more neurological deficit. We discharged the patient and tried to see. But if there is no progressive neurological deficit, then or intractable seizures, something like that, or signs of raised ICP, maybe that lesion can go and obstruct the arcadal. The patient can present with the hydrocephalus. We might go for for the hydrocephalus, or we can go for the lesion when there is progressive neurological deficit. So there are lesions in the midbrain where you can just watch and see, or you can just check your um, do like a follow up on the patient. There are also other ways you can go and operate and the patient does well. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you. Well, thank you, Doctor. I have a question. Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead, Nathan. Yes, I just wanted to ask. Uh, actually, we had a patient, a young child. I think she was something like seven. Uh, so hopefully, in our countries, uh, patients come to the hospital and sometimes it's already late. But this child came, let's just say, three months earlier. She was having a, um, uh, uh, how can I, she was having a, um, uh, uh, hemi hemiparesis with uh, signs of compression. We, uh, she was having a hydrocephalus, but it was not yet, um, how can I say, she wasn't yet having uh, signs of uh, intracranial high pressure. So the child went and came back, let me just say, three months later, and she was sometimes kind of uh, with an MRI. And uh, she was, um, I think she was having a glioma of the midbrain. I think we saw that patient with, uh, with I think, I think the service, yeah. I should go to Zilan. Yeah, uh, we saw and the patient. I, I should the patient. But the child was already in a very bad state. She was very unconscious. She was uh, having some signs of engagement. She was decortication, so we couldn't do really much. What I want to ask is, if you want to follow up a patient like this child with a suspicion of glioma through the MRI, knowing that you don't have means to operate, what do you think three months earlier could be done, could have been done to, let me just say, prolong or let me just say, add some, some months to her life or, I don't know, some years. Well, um, can I ask her? Uh, worsening after three months is a, a very fast growing. So uh, I uh, I like to see the the MRI picture, but it, it seems like a uh, uh, anaplastic glioma, I guess. But I don't, but I know I not seen the the MRI, so it was anaplastic or uh, even worse, uh, a glioblastoma. Fortunately, the prognosis is uh, is very bad. Yeah, I think I have the image, but I don't, it's very far in my phone, so to check now will be a little bit difficult. But next time, I think I'll show it to Dr. Marco so that you can see. The child mm -hmm. died, three, died three days later, though we gave corticoids, we gave, uh, let me just say, we put her in a position in mm -hmm. which she could. Well, uh, I have a question. I, Do you can, mean the, uh, the hydrocephalus? Yeah, she was having hydrocephalus. Okay, and you, because it was already compressing, it was sodium, uh, it was sodium compressing the aqueduct. Mm. Okay, that was obstructive hydrocephalus. Did you, did yeah. you shut the patient? No, did it didn't shut because let me just say, uh, we had to, uh, when cases are arise like that to us, the family, we have to put the family to, we have to give a good counseling because we will tell, we usually tell them that we will do the, the shunt, but that, that doesn't guarantee that the child will live longer. So usually they choose, let me just say, kind of standardization. They, they just choose the, the other way around that we should leave the child. So that's what happened actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Well, in the, the next time, uh, uh, if you have the, the picture of them right, 
I think we can uh, uh, have a, a better uh, a better understanding of what's the, what's the situation. Okay. Because uh, it should be interesting to analyze the case. Yeah, maybe maybe uh, if you still have those images next time, like maybe next uh, Saturday, you can share. You can share. You can share them. Then we see. We try to discuss. Yeah. Yeah, I think I took the images. I'll I'll try and show you next time. It's okay. Okay. Sure. Any cases that are interesting, you guys are welcome. But I guess you're, we're doing the series now, so we'll complete the series. Uh, if you want to have more, that's fine too. Or if you want to wait till attending, we could we could do uh, you know whatever you guys think is good educationally in the neurosurgery field. And I want to reiterate, you got you medical student. Well, there's one more student, I believe. Hawaii, are you there? Hawaii, I don't see your real name on your screen. Are you there? You want to make a comment? I, I see you're in your car uh, participating. We appreciate that. Are you there? Can you hear me, Hawaii? Possibly. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time audio. audio. Can you guys understand? I think he's not talking to me. Are you having a hard time here? Uh, is anybody understanding at all? Or is it me? No. I, think, uh, I think I think that uh, they call the 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 the, the talking with another person. Uh, uh, you have to please un unmute him. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You students are lucky to, to be with three neurosurgeons on a Saturday. Man, oh man! Like I said last week. It, 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 during when I was in medical school, I hardly ever even talked to a neurosurgeon. Never mind spend an hour with them on the internet. Of course, we didn't have internet. But let me tell you guys two pieces of great news for, and the first one has to do with uh, the African uh, neurosurgical community. Uh, we uh, we are collaborating with uh, Khalif Abdafatar from Nairobi, Kenya, or perhaps someone of you may know him. Uh, we're in the process now of trying to set up the cadaver lab in Nairobi. They have an active cadaver lab now. Uh, what okay. we're trying to do is, is to film it and to have uh, good audio from the cadaver dissector because the, the dissector needs really good audio. And so we sent some headphones wireless headphones for the dissector to be able to comment while they're dissecting. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, they need to comment and they need to interact. Like, for example, Natalie has a question. What's this? What's that? They can interact with you without fumbling with their hands and stuff. They, they, the hands are free so they can dissect and point and comment on. on. So anyways, uh, we're in the process of setting that up so that in Cameroon, you won't I mean, obviously, it's better to go to Nairobi, but sometimes you can't. So hopefully, we'll be able to televise these cadaver dissections in an interactive. It's not just a video. It's going to be interactive, which adds another layer of value to an educational experience. Yeah, that's so, a great idea. Yeah, so hopefully, we'll get that lab going and get people, students from in Africa access to cadaver lab uh, because I know even in the United States too sometimes you have a hard time getting to, to a cadaver lab because a cadaver lab needs and we can talk frankly here we're doctors it needs a refrigeration system uh, you've got to be able to preserve the cadavers 
So there's not many places that can afford to have a full-time refrigeration for cadavers, but Nairobi has a center. Uh, I don't know how many more there are. There's probably one in Cairo and possibly in Morocco. Uh, but uh, we're certainly going to try to use that. And uh, there is another piece of good news is we're having an app made uh, which will allow people to watch these transmissions from their iPhone very easily. They'll just tap, just make, you can't see this here, but they'll just tap on the, on the icon for the app and then tap one more time and they'll be at watching the live presentation on their smartphone. And there'll be a link at the bottom. They, if they like the presentation, they can click it and enter it. What do you guys think of that? Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good thing. Yeah, because yes, that, uh, is it not? Is that not for Android phones? Yes, uh, yeah, I'm gonna. I'll send you the link. I'll, well, I can't send links because I can't send links to foreign countries. I don't know. Facebook's restricting me, but um, uh, certainly. Uh, I'll email you the link to the beta of Android. Uh, and iPhone is being developed now. That takes another couple of weeks. Um, but we hope, hopefully that adds another feature to interactivity and accessibility. Ease, ease of access is a big step in the internet. If you can make it easy for people to do things, they'll do it, most likely. Uh, and if it's hard, they won't do it. So hopefully we cut, we make it more accessible and easier to do. Sonatas, I didn't realize that now I see your picture. Hello there. Could you please introduce yourself? Hello, Sonatas. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Well, maybe you can't. Okay. Well, anyways, let me tell you. Sonatas Johnson, he's a medical student from Dominican Republic. And uh, he'll be very active too. So, okay, that's that's great. Any closing comments, uh, Marco? Um, I have a case, Dr. Marco and Dr. Kabulu. Please, can you give me uh, an idea of what could have been done? Okay. Uh, I wish to share a picture. Oh, okay. I'm sorry to cut you off. Let's keep rolling, man. It's four. Uh, I don't know. Can you yes, see the picture? See yes, we can see it. Yes. You make a little bigger. Uh, okay. Well, you fell off there. Uh, you, fell off. you fell off there. Now. Let me. Uh, let me yeah. check. I'm using my uh, my phone, so it's not Smart easy. Phone. Yeah, yeah. You gotta get good at that. Uh, can you see the images? Yes. Yes. It's good size too. Okay. Actually, it is a 34 years old patient who uh, had um, a history of tuberculosis when he was uh, something like uh, 24, and who came uh, 10 years later and was having a, a, a spinal cord compression. He was at um, with a score of uh, McCormick at three. That uh, he was uh, was working, but uh, not all by himself. So uh, on Monday, on Monday we enter the theater. So since we only we, we, the only means that we have to try to drain and uh, remove this is uh, the posterior to the posterior and to do a, a laminectomy, a simple laminectomy, just to decompress and to drain a little. Mm. So I just wanted to ask, uh, could with little means because we don't have much, could we? Could we have done better, or what was the best uh, approach to this uh, patient? Mm. Well, no, uh, the posterior uh, laminectomy is actually the, the best approach in this case. Um, I, and the, the aspect uh, it seems, uh, anyway, <laughs> quite, quite bad. Uh, yeah. So I think the, you you did the best things. Mm. Uh, any uh, any report uh, by the the pathologist to us to us? Uh, not yet. We are they are very late. We are they are really uh, due to scarce means. They do like something like three three more three three weeks to give us uh, mm. and, and 
anatomopatologic a pathological diagnosis. Dr. Yeah. Bennett, uh, Dylan is asking, you want to come in? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. No, then, uh, Dylan, so, I don't see him there. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to get him. Okay, Christian? Yeah. Do, okay, do, do you do also like uh, image guided biopsy? No. Radiologists, they don't do it. Like CT, really. CT guided biopsy. <laughs> No, they don't. They don't really do it. Okay. Uh, you mean the patient is no Actually, longer. Most working. of them are. Uh, they don't like. Uh, they do it for some other pathology, uh, pathologies such as abdominal pathologies, but for neurosurgery people are a little bit afraid. <laughs> okay. Um, is the patient walking? Yeah, he's at three or three on five. He's three on five power in the lower limbs. Yeah, in the lower limbs. Okay. Uh, you you mean she was he was he or she is he a male or female? It's a male. Male. He was treated for TB ten years ago. Ten years below. Yeah. That, that was pulmonary TB. Mhm. Mm it was a pulmonary one. Pulmonary. Yeah. If you are suspecting like a TB now, I think he has to 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 get his anti TB treatment and the uh, immobilization you immobilize the patient uh mm -hmm. surgery is not the first indication here you treat your patient mm -hmm. then uh, if possible you can do your ct guided biopsy you send to histology to get your 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 result your histology result but if you are not suspecting tb it's like something else because the image is too small you can't see it properly uh, then you can do your laminectomy, like Dr. Marco is saying. Um, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. okay. Thank you. I was just asking, uh, could an anterior um, approach, could it be done an anterior approach to, to remove, mm. to drain or to remove the lesions? I don't know. Thoracic, can you go back to the image which is showing the, 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 the yeah, lesion? Please. Yes. And okay, the okay, approach okay. in the thoracic region is not easy. There are many structures there. That lesion, you can still remove it from, from posterior. You do your laminectomy uh, posteriorly, then you go and remove that, uh, that, uh, that lesion. Um, is this image? Sagittal, no, no, the sagittal image. Mm, okay. Let me see. Uh, wait. Uh, yeah, there we go. I don't know. You got it. You got it. No, this is Corona. Okay. Let me check. Sorry. Uh, you rarely use the anterior approach, right, Dr. Gabolo? I'm not a neurosurgeon, but I don't, it's rarely used, only in the neck, right? Yes, in the yeah, neck, correct. usually we do anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. But, yeah, but in the lumbar region, I, it's very yeah. rare, I, I think. Yes, this, this one, can you, you see the one on the left, okay, again? Mm -hmm. Yes, again. No, go back to that level where you were before. Yeah, a little bit in the midline. Yeah, this is lateral. Okay. Okay. Midline. This is more lateral. Correct. Okay. Can you go back again, like go to the midline? Uh, how should I do? I don't understand. There's, there's, there's an image you just showed now. Yeah, yeah, was, that's it. yeah, this one, this one. Oh, sorry, you, you went again. Go back to that one. <laughs> okay. I should go back to the other. I don't know. Yes, we'll tell you when to yeah. stop. Yeah, this one, this one. Okay. 
Is it okay? No, no, no. The other one. The second one, David. This one? Try to no. Try to go to go up. Up. Yeah, Upwards. Again. Okay. Okay. Stop. 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 Okay. Uh, stop. Oh. Stop. B. Uh, <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Uh. Uh. Yeah. Don't don't go fast. Don't go fast. Okay. Can you stop there? Okay. okay. Perfect. Uh. This is P1. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh -huh. exactly. Where you can see hyper intense lesion on the vertebral body. It is not labeled. Um, then uh, within the canal is that huge lesion, which is also hyper intense on P1. There is also pre vertebral uh, lesion, which is also yeah. hyper intense there. Um, <laughs> Then there is a reduced disc space between the, the that vertebral body with the uh, hyper intense lesion, with the one above. Well, yeah. So, do you have the the, the image on um, the T two image? Oh, sorry. I don't think I took, took all the images, but let me check. Yeah. Mm. Let's also image. Yeah, I think I took. Is he okay? Yes. Then um, this is still T one. T one. T one. Oh, sorry. Uh, it seems as if this is the only bit that I took about. Okay, uh, T one above. One. That one above. That's T two. The one above. Okay. That's T two. Okay. I didn't really take enough images, so sorry. Yeah, there is, there is code compression. Yeah, there is code compression. Yes, can you see that line of CSF, the white, which is mm -hmm. not going up to down there. And there is yeah. also signal change within the code. Um, then um, that those two vertebral body, they look hyper, hyper intense with that uh, deposit. Yeah. Sorry? Was D5 and D6? Mm -hmm. Was this? D5. Uh, it was between D5 and the vertebra, the T5, the T5 and T6. It was between. Uh, okay. Dorsal 5, dorsal 6. T5 yeah. and T6. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. But mm -hmm. yes, we can think of TB, but it looks unusual to be TB. Did you check if there is. Um, uh, like a primary lesion somewhere there? Um, no. Is that uh, we, we, uh, is, we collected due to his uh, issue of treatment of TB, primary TB, in uh, 10 years mm. earlier? Okay. Mm. Yeah. And it's I very frequent in our country. So. Sorry. There was an epidemiologic uh, there was an epidemiologic argument, and uh, there was also uh, some signs of impregnation of tuberculosis, like uh, night fevers, mm -hmm. night fevers and sweatings, chronic night okay. fevers and sweatings. I, I think uh, our senior Dr. Marco who, who tried to give also uh, his comment. I think uh, immobilization. You give a thoracolumbar corset. Uh, you sat the, the patient on anti TB. Uh, now they are even talking, you can go up to 18 months, the lowest, which is like 12 months of anti-TB. Usually with TB, the patient, they recover. They recover after treatment, and the surgery is not the, 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 the first modality of treatment for TB spine. I don't know, Dr. Marco is our senior, I can still add some. Um, uh, 
well, actually, uh, I have a few experience about case of uh, uh, POTS uh, disease, uh, uh, so TBC disease uh, in invertebra. Uh, I just see uh, so a case during my experience of Pakistan uh, guy, the guys, uh, but uh, uh, the vertebra were already uh, uh, already. Um, crashed uh, so we perform uh, also a vertebrectomy but it was a, a, a dorsal lumbar uh, aspect so we perform a, a retropleural approach uh, in this case anyway uh, i uh, perform first of all a, a laboratory exam like quantiferon to see if there is a, a tuberculosis miliarius uh, i guess is the terms uh, uh, so a uh, uh, diffuse tuberculosis uh, and I uh, uh, I start the uh, anti tuberculosis therapy and then uh, uh, the posterior laminectomy is uh, actually mandatory because if there is a, a spinal compression you just need to decompress uh, um, I don't know then I, I, as I just told you I don't have so much experience so I don't know if the the only therapy can uh, reduce the compression uh, in the spinal cord. By the way, uh, I guess the uh, spinal cord decompression uh, is, um, uh, is absolutely uh, unstable uh, to, to try to save the, 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 the leg patients uh, and the, the, the motility uh, of the patients in the lower, lower limbs. Uh, then the involvement of vert vertebra, uh, I, don't, I won't perform any vertebrectomy, uh, but just uh, uh, as I just told you, Cabulo uh, immobilize using the cast uh, and uh, to see the, uh, what uh, we, we get from the laboratory exam about tuberculosis or uh, by the pathological exam, this is a uh, neoplasia and what sort of neoplasia is, and then start the uh, the therapy, uh, anti tuberculosis or chemotherapy, was the 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 result of the pathological exam. That's my, my opinion. Okay. Yes, thank you, thank you, Doctor Marco. Yeah. So, Christo, it was better if you the, the radiologist could do um, CT guided biopsy. So you name okay. first your lesion. Yeah. Then you you do it. Okay. Okay. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Okay. Let me get you off the screen share. You want to discuss this image anymore, Natal? Uh, yeah, yeah. You're all right. Okay, I'm just going to bump you off there. Let me just share this. Okay. Get out there. And okay. to, today, today, today is the birthday of uh, one giant of neurosurgery, the father of uh, micro, modern micro neurosurgery, Professor Yasajiu from Teki. Yeah. Uh, Happy birthday. birthday. Yes. <laughs> one of the big. I don't know, Dr. Marco, have you met him before? Uh, yeah, sir, yeah. No, I don't have this. Uh, this uh, lucky. <laughs> so who's that? Who's that again, Doctor Kabulo? Professor Yasajiu. Mahmoud Gazi Yasajiu. Oh, yes, sir. For, yes. From Istanbul, right, Turkey? Yes, yeah. I, I met him uh, twice in Istanbul. Yeah, you you went to Istanbul, yeah. Yes, I met him uh, twice in Istanbul. He's great. You, you know, even um, yeah, that he's a legend. He's a legend. Yes, he's a yeah. legend. The father of oh, modern wow. micro oh, yeah. oh, okay. oh, Ninety-six uh, years old today. Guess, he's yeah. now ninety-four. <laughs> is he still operating? Yeah. He's still operating. Yes. Ninety-four years old. <laughs> oh my God! There's hope. There's hope. <laughs> yeah, but John is is not a an, 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 uh, usual neurosurgeon. He's a, a god. <laughs> he's yeah, a god. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I've seen pictures <laughs> like with him. I, didn't, I, I I knew the name, but I didn't realize he was so big. Oh, yes, he's too big, this one. So what I like at his hospital, he has his uh, engineers in theater. The time he's operating, if he can't reach a lesion, he's telling the engineer, you see now I like an instrument like this, so I can reach that instrument. And really? after one week, two weeks, they will make an instrument for him. Really? So he's operating wow. with his engineer wow. in theater, yes. Wow. 
yeah. I, 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 I imagine under the microscope, you need good visual acuity, right? Your eyes need to be pretty good, right? Yeah, and his hands too. Uh, I never, never meet him, but uh, I hear some stories about colleagues that uh, uh, work with him. And he's uh, uh, incredible. He operates uh, alone the, the aneurysm uh, and perform uh, using bipolar forceps uh, uh, mm -hmm. mi microsensor. All the procedure uh, is absolutely great. And uh, he, he, he don't uh, care about the, um, uh, the form. If need to get down on the knee to, to see better, he get down on the knee. He's, he's incredible. He's a very he, the, uh, my colleagues uh, define him as the 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 uh, the, the, uh, the great uh, mo mobile neurosurgeon <laughs> because mm -hmm. he's moving in all the position to perform surgery. But it's yeah. incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Well, I uh, hope all on the panel are operating in '94. I hope they all are. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I never realized, I, I seen his picture, I never realized he was 94. Yeah, I think uh, that uh, uh, only Harvey Cushing uh, was uh, compared to Yazarian. Yeah, sure. Wow. Yeah. Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's tremendous. tremendous. He's a giant. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll try to get him on the uh, Cameroon Weekly uh, uh, webcast. You never know. You never, you, you might get lucky someday. Now the excessive love, John. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks. It's a great session, great interactive session. The real power of this platform, which was used today, I appreciate the uh, the neurosurgeons coming out and Dylan for preparing a very good, present, very excellent presentation. And uh, hang around, guys. We'll chat a little bit and we'll just wrap this up formally. Thanks, Dr. Cabullo and Dr. Uh, Marco and Dylan and Natalie. Thank you too, guys. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.